I always remember the ride to my grandma's house when I was younger. We lived in a different state than she did, and the majority of the ride would be us driving on the interstate. When we got closer to the area that she lived in, we would get off onto the local roads. I always knew that we were almost to grandma's house when we began going down the dirt road that led to it. I would always perk up and look out the windows to see all the sights there were to see on that road. There were lots of big trees that we recognized. There was also an old decaying shed that was right along the road, and sitting a bit back a ways was a really old decaying house out amongst the trees. It must have been abandoned for a very long time before too, because not only was it in a visibly awful state, but if it had a driveway, it had long since been grown over by grass, bushes, and trees. I always asked my parents and my grandma about the house. However, none of them really knew anything about it. It had been abandoned long before even my grandma had bought the place. They also warned me to not even think about trying to go over there though. They didn't even care if we hiked around on someone else's property. That wasn't their concern. However, they thought that old and abandoned house was likely to be very dangerous, and that's why they wanted to keep us away from it. Well, you know, children, when you tell them not to do something, that makes them really want to do it. Although for many years we did listen to our parents' advice and did not try to go and explore the old house. There came a time, though, when I was about 12 years old, and I was the only kid who was at my grandma's house. I was pretty bored that none of my cousins were there, and I really hated listening to all the adults talking back then. So I told my parents I was going to go for a walk. It was a really lovely fall day, and those were the days I liked the most. Basically, all my mom told me to do was wear a jacket, and I did so. It was pretty cold outside, and the leaves were heavily falling from the trees. It was sort of desolate as well since it wasn't an area in which many people lived, and thus there weren't people or cars on the road. It was a simple and peaceful fall walk. Now, I hadn't set out with any intention of going to check out that old house. It was just by chance that I chose to walk in that direction up the road, and not the other one. After walking for a while though, the house came into view, and I began to consider going and checking it out. I began making my way through all the trees to get to the house. I was a little bit nervous about someone driving by and seeing me. The last thing I wanted to do was get into trouble. If one of my aunts or uncles were driving to my grandma's house and saw me, it would have been a whole lot of fuss when my parents found out. I managed to get to the house without anyone catching me though. I nervously walked around the building. I considered stepping up on the porch but it honestly looked like it might collapse if I tried to do that. I decided I would walk around to the back and see what was going on on the other side. Unsurprisingly, it was even more overgrown back there. However, there were some windows I could look through that didn't involve me having to get onto the porch. I did have to get some weeds and tall grass flattened down though in order for me to see through it. When I was finally able to get a good look into the window, I was not too surprised with how it looked inside. It seemed like I was looking into a bedroom. There was a metal frame for an old bed inside. It looked like there was a dresser as well. I was immediately curious as to what might be in it. I moved to where there was a back door to the old house. I was wondering if I would be able to get in through it. However, even though it was so old and decrepit, it was locked up tight and the door refused to budge. There was a small window in the door, so I was able to see into the kitchen of the house. There was a table and some appliances in there that were very, very old. As I continued looking though, I caught something out of the corner of my eye. I could have sworn I'd just seen something moving in one of the hallways. I shook my head in bewilderment, but even at 12 years old, I knew your eyes could play tricks on you. I didn't take it too seriously and decided to get a better look through another window. I also reconsidered trying out the front porch to see if I was able to get into the house through that door. I had already forgotten the movement I thought I'd seen. I began walking toward one of the other windows, wanting to get a look into another one of the rooms. 
As I pulled up to it, though, I almost fell over, but I saw myself staring right into the eyes of one of the oldest and gnarlest looking people I'd ever seen before. The shock sent me back so far, I fell on my butt amongst the bushes. My hands landed on some thorny vines, and it cut me pretty bad. Suddenly, the back door opened. The really old and filthy man burst out of the house. His appearance was scary enough, but he was carrying a hatchet in his right hand as well. He appeared to be trying to talk to me, but I could only make out a few words of what he was uttering. You stupid, trying to break into my house? I'll cut you up good, boy. He lifted his hatchet up as though to strike. Fortunately for me, however, he was a very old man, and although scary, he could not move very fast. I was able to get up off the ground faster than he could reach me. It hurt badly getting up because I had the thorns stuck in my hands, but I didn't pay much attention to the pain. The man was close to me, and if I didn't book it as quickly as possible, I knew he was going to mess me up. I got up and ran away from him through the woods. My goal, however, was to try and get back to the dirt road. It would be easiest to run back to my grandma's house that way. Other than for a few moments, though, it didn't seem like the old man had the stamina to chase me. I was able to slow down once I got back to the road. Looking back at that house, I didn't see any sign of him at all. I was still scared about what happened enough to hurry my way back to grandma's house, though. I didn't tell anyone what happened until years later. I was able to explain the cuts and stuff from just falling during a simple hike. However, I was more scared of the possible punishment I would get for being on that property. Years later, when I was an adult and finally told the story, no one really believed me. That was okay, I suppose, but the story absolutely happened, and I'll never forget the way that old man looked when he came after me. One of the worst things to ever happen to me happened a very long time ago, but I've always remembered it very clearly. I'll get this out of the way in the beginning. Not only did it happen out in the hills, it happened before everyone had a phone on them all the time, so I was not able to call for help when I needed it. One of my favorite things to do was drive over to my uncle's cabin out in the country and have a nice evening with him on Saturday. A lot of times, those visits would go really late into the night though, and then I would have to drive home through the dark country roads. I couldn't sleep in anyone's bed but my own, so I couldn't bring myself to spend the night over at his place. My uncle lived so far out in the hills that it took a good amount of time getting back to the main roads too. The night this happened was one of those nights. We had been up all night having some beers and stuff, much more unthinkable now than it was back then of course. We had been laughing and having a great time the entire way. The hour was getting late though and everyone else was already heading off to bed. Even though I felt pretty tired myself, I decided to go out for a nighttime drive home. Yeah, as I mentioned above, I was probably somewhat impaired, which made driving during the night like that even more dangerous than it actually was. You have to realize just how absolutely dark it was outside. There were no lights along the dirt roads up in those hills. Plus, there were so many trees that even when the moon was out at night, it really didn't make much of a difference at all. The only light source at all came from the headlights of the small pickup truck I was driving, and it was so concentrated in front of me that it was hard to see from the sides at all. The roads were pretty dangerous as well, extremely narrow, and didn't have enough room for cars going in opposite directions. No guardrails either. So there I was driving down that road, trying to drive as carefully as possible and slowly as I could do without running into any problems. I was putting all my focus into driving and making my way safely out of these hills so I could get some sleep. There were so many twists and turns in the road. All it would take was one deer to jump out in front of me in order to cause a really bad accident. I was paying attention, but I wasn't too worried about anything actually happening. At that time, I had never been in an accident before. I was sort of lost in my own thoughts when I rounded a corner on the hill. Once I did, two big redneck boys suddenly jumped out in front of my truck. 
I came upon them so suddenly that I couldn't control my reaction when I saw them. My hands on the steering wheel immediately swerved to the right to avoid hitting the two men, and when they did so, that caused my car to fly right off the road and off the side of the hill. I would love to tell you about what was happening at that point, but I seriously can't even recall what happened. I do know that I swerved after that, but I can't remember anything else. I can put together a rough image of what happened in my head though. I mean, obviously, I swerved off the side of the road and the hill. My truck likely turned over several times when it was flopping down it, and when that happened, it knocked me out pretty good. Everything after is sort of a blur. Several times, I came in and out of consciousness. I thought I heard and saw both of those redneck boys more than once. Knowing afterward how far my truck had fallen down that hill, they must have made a significant effort to try and get down there to where I was. I kept hearing them talking, but I wasn't able to make sense of what they were saying. At times, it seemed they were discussing whether or not they thought I was dead. I wanted to say something to let them know I wasn't, but I didn't seem to know how to do that in the moment. There was some talk as well about possibly burning my truck so there wouldn't be any evidence of what happened. That terrified me, but I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't move or do anything to get their attention. I knew they opened the cab of the truck at some point. I found out later they had taken my wallet as well, since it's never been found. All I can figure is they must have figured out I was still alive, and that must have convinced them against burning my truck or anything like that. They also didn't do anything to help me though, which I know for a fact. I recall quite clearly waking up in the hospital the next morning. The reason I was brought there was because my uncle had stumbled across me in the morning many hours after I'd crashed. There had been no calls to the police or for an ambulance before that. I asked my uncle if the two men I'd seen seemed familiar to him, but he had no idea who they might have been. As far as I know, he never found out either. Although I doubt they deliberately were in the way and caused the accident on purpose, they didn't do anything to help and could have conceivably hurt or even killed me if they had burned my truck. This happened to me when I was only 14 years old. It was after my parents had begun working at home and were able to move out to the country. They had always said they had planned on moving out there if they could afford to do so. They had both been raised in rural areas, but had gone to college and stayed in the city after they graduated. Once they were able to afford it, there had always been plans to move out to the country though. I was an only child, so I didn't have brothers or sisters to keep me company. My parents also chose to move at the end of the school year, so I could finish up at school that year before moving. I'm happy the way they did it, but it also kept me from being able to make new friends at school before the summer break. It was also such an extremely rural area that there wasn't much of an opportunity to make friends anyway. A lot of that summer was just spent with me doing my own thing due to this. It was the first time in my life I didn't have any friends, so it was rather difficult for me to handle. It had also not been too long after I started getting more interested in girls. It didn't help that I would have so many thoughts about them but with no contact at all. I would often have these big romantic fantasies. I would go for walks after my parents went to sleep just to think. It was a way to lose myself in my thoughts, which was one of my favorite things at that time. The night that this story happened, I was on one of my regular late night walks. I can't tell you exactly how long I had been out walking, lost deep in my thoughts, when I began to hear a strange noise outside. It was really hard to make out what exactly the noise was, but I could swear I could hear it coming from different areas. I wasn't scared in the moment, however. I was intrigued by whatever this strange noise could have been. As I kept walking and hearing these things though, I started to piece together what was actually going on. I hadn't been out in the country very long and wasn't used to the weird sounds that were out there at night yet. I knew this too, so I continued doing my thing and walking along. All of a sudden though, I heard a weird shrieking noise. Of course, as I heard this, I turned around instantly to look in that direction, and when I did, 
I saw the scariest thing I had ever seen in my life. There was a large, shadowy figure standing in the woods. That would have been frightening enough, but it almost looked like it had glowing red eyes as well. It seemed whatever this was was looking right at me. I would like to think in retrospect I would have turned and run away, but I thought I was seeing something that not many people would ever see, and I wanted to take it all in even though I was terrified. A few seconds after I'd seen it, it seemed the red eyes disappeared, and then suddenly I could no longer see the shadowy figure either. It was at that point the fear finally hit me, and I turned and ran away, wanting to get back home after that weird experience. Throughout my life, I've experienced many unusual and often unpleasant situations. For privacy reasons, I don't want to give away too much information about myself, but I will say I'm a 21-year-old girl now living in Ireland, where I've lived over five years. I grew up in a small Eastern European country, of which about 40% are Russian, and I'm of Russian descent as well. Even though almost everyone in my country spoke fluent Russian and much of the population had Russian relatives, ethnic tensions within this country were very high. It was not uncommon for you to receive a lower salary or worse treatment in shops and other public places if the place was run by natives. It's because of this I believe I was singled out as a target in this particular story. That and my feeble appearance as well, as I've always been quite short and skinny. My neighborhood, like any other in the area, consisted of many blocks of Soviet apartments, remnants of the USSR, rotting away but nevertheless housing hundreds of people. It was a good enough neighborhood, all things considered, and I would not have called my family particularly poor. The building we lived in, though, was rather bleak. The hallway was always dark and stank of piss or other bodily excretions. The building was quite tall and had this old creaky elevator, which smelled no better than the hallway itself, and often scared you into thinking it was about to break. This, however, was still more favorable than climbing the even darker sets of stairs, which often had people sleeping in them or groups of teenagers gathering to do drugs. The layout of the place is unimportant but I believe the description of the shadiness will set the scene. After a year or two of living this building with little occurrences aside from stumbling upon the occasional stoner with a knife trying to rob me for drug money, or a drunk passed out in front of my apartment, I started to notice these two native kids hanging around the neighborhood, a girl and a boy. At first, they never really spoke to me, and I paid little mind to them either. I would often notice as time went on them staring at me whenever I passed by or gazing out from a distance as I played with the other neighborhood kids. These kids seemed weird to say the least. They spoke a limited amount of Russian and pretty much never interacted with anyone else. They would always just stand there watching me. Despite them being very similar looking, Nobody knew if they were related or just two weirdos living in the building who'd stumbled upon each other. I remember always just assuming they must be brother and sister. After a while of this not-so-casual staring, they began to harass me on my walk home. They'd tease me, push me, just generally attempt to get on my nerves with what little Russian insults they knew. I had a pretty thick skin, so this didn't really bother me too much, though. I would either completely ignore them or fight back with what I thought were rather witty comebacks. These kids were absolutely relentless, though. Over time, I began to wonder why they decided to randomly pick on me so much. I had never said a single word to them before. I'd never played with them in any significant amount. I really didn't know them at all. I decided to settle for the they-must-just-be-a-bit-weird explanation. Nevertheless, this was all just teasing, right? Kids just being kids. One day on my walk home, though, the strange duo were on my heels as usual, the boy making some crude comments about my nationality and how I should go home back to Russia, lots of other unrelated insults as well, while the girl also mocked me. 
I did my best to ignore their behavior, not feeling in the mood to dignify them with a clever comeback this time. It became increasingly difficult. It seemed in frustration the two had suddenly become much more aggressive than usual. All the other times this would go on, they'd just give up and leave me alone after a while. But this time, to my surprise, they followed me into my building and into that poorly lit, stinky hallway. Still ignoring them, I pressed the button for the elevator when I felt the boy roughly grab me from behind. I was in shock. The girl joined him, bending my arm at an incredibly uncomfortable position behind my back. What the hell are you doing? I screamed at them. They began attempting to drag me into the black staircase, telling me to shut the fuck up. I struggled, of course, not really understanding what had suddenly come into these two. I mean, I knew they were weird, but this was something else. This didn't feel like childhood bullies or kids just being kids. These two had something sinister on their minds. As I struggled against their duo grip, trying to break my way free and towards the elevator that had now arrived, a middle-aged woman walked into the hallway. A look of confusion was on her face as she asked, Is anyone going up? I desperately called out that I was, reaching for the elevator, only to hear the guy holding me snarl, You're not going anywhere. To my surprise, despite the pure desperation in my voice and the fact I was fighting two seemingly older kids trying to drag me away, the woman didn't do anything. She didn't even ask what was going on, just shrugged her shoulders and walked into the elevator and closed the doors. What was going through her mind still makes me curious. I assume this was probably due to assuming this was nothing serious because of our age. Perhaps her not wanting to get involved any more than she already had in order to avoid trouble. After all, our neighborhood was not the safest. Best to stay out of things whenever you can. Luckily, her leaving became a surge of adrenaline, partially from my desire to get into that elevator and away from these two, and partially from anger at her refusing to do anything. It's amazing what the human body can do when faced with a dangerous situation. Using all of my strength, I whipped around and slammed the boy into the wall behind me, immediately making both of them let go of me. I could tell the two of them were as shocked as I was at what I had just done. As I said, I was a fairly small girl, but it felt as though someone else had possessed me in that moment. All I knew is I had to get away from this dark area. As soon as I was let go, I ran to the elevator and managed to get the doors open again and inside. The last thing I remember seeing is the doors slamming shut before we took off. The girl's shocked expression as she stared at me. The lady in the elevator didn't say a word to me, didn't even look at me. I wish I could say it ended there. A few days later, I was confident in my ability now to defend myself against those two and was pretty sure they would not attempt to attack me again or even go near me. That relief, however, was fairly short-lived. A friend of mine knocked on my door at the usual time I would go out on a free day, asking me to hang out. I, of course, excitedly agreed, and as soon as I was ready, we headed out and to the elevator. As mentioned previously, the elevator itself was not all that sturdy and would easily break down. That's not the only thing that made it extremely unsafe, though. If you were a child and were taking the elevator alone, especially in a building as tall as ours where there were many, many floors, you never knew what the person who got on with you turned out to be, or what they could do to you, especially if the elevator suddenly got stuck. This wasn't something that happened often enough to prevent us from using it and instead take those dreaded stairs. We got on without a worry in the world and pressed the button for the ground floor. We began chatting about nothing in particular. About four floors down though, the elevator stopped, letting on a burly middle-aged man. Just the sight of him was intimidating. He had this sunken in face and long black greasy hair, sweat stains under his arms. His belly was so fat it took up most of the room in that tiny elevator, pushing my friend and I into a corner. We just kind of fell silent. At first, the man said nothing, just stared at the two of us as the elevator door slowly closed. I could tell that much like myself, my friend had an uneasy feeling about this man. In a deep, hoarse voice, he leaned in and said slowly and calmly, Oh, you think you're so tough, don't you? It was more of a statement than a question. I could tell it was directed at me. He pressed the elevator stop button, screeching it to a halt. He reached out and grabbed me by the fringe, 
He pinned me against the wall of the elevator, still holding on and beginning to pull me up. I could feel some strands of my hair ripping out of my skull as I was being lifted. However, not enough for my feet to lose contact with the ground. I squealed in pain, and my friend watched in shock cowering into the corner, unable to do anything. Well, I can be tough too. I began to try and make him let go of my hair to no avail. The more I moved, the more my fringe ripped out, and the more painful it became. Eventually, I stopped struggling and attempted to stand up on my tippy toes as much as I could. You think it's funny to hurt my son, huh? For a second, I had no idea what he was on about, but then I realized. The boy I had slammed against the wall in an attempt to get away. He must have told his parents what happened, most likely neglecting to include the fact he had attacked me first. Or maybe he had and his father just didn't give a shit. He seemed like a piece of crap himself. I know what floor you live on. If you ever touch my son again, I'll bring a knife through your throat in this fucking elevator. You understand me? Before I could respond, it began to move again. Someone must have called it onto another floor. He narrowed his eyes at me and let go of my hair, standing back and acting as if nothing had happened. We stopped and another person got on a few floors down. The rest of the ride was spent in silence. I don't know what was scarier, the fact this clearly insane man was threatening my life, and the fact his equally loopy son stalked me without my knowledge to find out what floor I lived on and what my routine was just to get his psycho dad to threaten me.